Welcome, everyone. Hello. I am Karen Welch. I am senior content producer for Panhandle PBS, and I am excited to bring you this panel discussion. Uh, we are looking so forward to a conversation about what you've just seen. I think the reaction here is the same as, as when I've seen others watch it. There's kind of a silence of being stunned a little bit before you begin to to process and think of questions that you have. Um, and so we're here with our producers and Andrew Hay from Panhandle um, Plains Historical Museum. Um, I am going to, the, the impact and breadth of what these producers have covered in this series as well as the impact of that history is amazing. Um, here to add to that experience is Julie Dunphy. You met her earlier. She is uh, a producer for the film. And then next to her is Juliana Branham. She was a consulting producer uh, for the film. And you'll be excited to learn that if you want to know more about what's happening with Buffalo now, uh, Juliana has produced a short film called Homecoming. And it's a companion piece to this series. And we will learn more about how you can watch that and be coming to PBS this fall. Uh, Juliana served as a producer of the 2018 Emmy-nominated PBS series Native America. And she has directed and produced many other films and series on Native American subjects. Juliana is a citizen of the Quahada Band of the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma. Thank you both for being here. And joining them is Dr. Hay the inaugural executive director of the Cultural Foundation of the Texas Panhandle. His job includes serving as executive director of the Panhandle Plains Historical Museum and the Texas Panhandle Heritage Foundation, which produces the Texas Outdoor Musical in Paladero Canyon State Park. He holds a PhD from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and was a research fellow at St. Edmunds College and Trinity College at the University of Cambridge. Thank you, Andrea, for being here too. Julie, I'll start with you. Um, in making this film, what did you learn that you didn't know before? Well, it, it ranges all the way from fun facts, um, such as a bison calf can stand uh, between one and two minutes of age and can run with the herd at seven minutes. So I have a head full of fun facts about the bison. Um, to, you know, I had a sense, as I think most of us um, do from our, the history we learned in school, of the tragedy of the buffalo. I really, I think, in doing this deep dive, learned about the, the inextricable, inextricable link between Plains Indians and the buffalo. And... Uh, as you can see, um, you know, that became such a focus of the story, rightfully so. And, and I mean, it really dominates the, um, the first episode and then continues to play out in the second episode. So, you know, it's all the way from the broader themes to some of the, the smaller, you know, bison can hit a speed of 35 miles per hour. This is an 1,800-pound animal, can hit a speed of 35 miles per hour. Um, to um, the things, you know, the, the, the story of the buffalo in North America is just an amazing window onto so many aspects of our history, particularly westward expansion and um, the story of the people who inhabited this continent for 10, 12,000 years. And the ties to industrialization, too. Exactly. It's amazing when you see that direct tie. Right. And, and, you know, to understand some of the things you didn't see tonight was just how, you know, the getting caught up in a global economy and the, the, the demands of the market, you know, starting with the beaver and then, you know, moving on to the bison. I mean, we're, I think one of the things I learned was that the extermination of wildlife, not just the buffalo, that took place in the Western United States in the 19th century is the largest extermination of wildlife in known human history. And that, that was something I did not know before. Uh, that's stunning. 
Juliana, let's talk about homecoming. Give us an idea of where that picks up the story of the American buffalo and how we'll be able to watch. Sure. So um, we often talk about um, the series being um, two of three acts of the full story and the third act being today and the contemporary work that's being done um, uh, within uh, tribal communities and the uh, specifically the Intertribal Buffalo Council. And so this film is 18 minutes. It's a companion piece, as, as uh, you said, that um, will be um, available on PBS.org uh, after uh, the film premieres, the series premieres. But it picks up um, with a man named uh, Jason Baldez, who's Eastern Shoshone, and um, the work that he does on behalf of, uh, well, sev several buffalo conservation groups, including the Intertribal Buffalo Council. And we follow him as he uh, works to uh, not only bring uh, some buffalo back to uh, his tribe's herds in um, Wyoming on the Wind River Indian Reservation, but also um, uh, we see the transfer of uh, bison returning to the Menominee tribe in Wisconsin. And that's the first buffalo that they have had in 200 years. And so it was a very... Um, exciting time for their history. It was very emotional and we were able to be there with them and capture that on camera. And um, yeah, and it just sort of gives you um, sort of that third act of the story about what's happening and it's ongoing. Um, the Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, um, recently, earlier this year, committed uh, $25 million to, uh, to tribes to continue the restoration efforts. So it's all pretty exciting. It's still happening and it's still growing and and uh, tribes are are doing well and they're I think there's uh, 80 plus hertz around the country on tribal hertz so um, so it's just growing and growing and it's 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 been a really wonderful experience to follow all of that it's amazing Julie give some insight to this is a one you didn't know about but when you discussed uh, recently I've seen you speak and you discussed um, where you decided to stop the film and kind of why, what the what the the team's philosophy is with that. So the narrative stops more or less in 1933 when the American Bison Society declared this. There are now 4,000 buffalo. You know, from got down to under a thousand at the end of the 19th century. This animal is no longer um, in danger of extinction. So we sort of end the narrative there, um, but we also introduced the notion that um, this was short-sighted because, yes, the animal was no longer in danger of extinction, but it was existing in zoos and on feedlots. And what they didn't understand then was habitat and restoring habitat so an animal could roam free and bring back the plants, the grasses, the other animals that existed in what was the American Serengeti. So we, while the story kind of comes to that moment, we also pick up and say, here's what's happened when the Intertribal Buffalo Council was formed in the 1990s, and, and, and introduce the notion of a third act that it's up to all of us now to figure out where we're headed, and what are we going to do with this? Um, there are now, you know, 350,000 buffalo in the United States. Only about 40,000 of them are conservation herds. The rest are on feedlots um, being bred for meat. And um, so it just it becomes, it's just a question for all of us. What's this third act going to be? Andrew? The first thing I'd like to get is your reaction to the film. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I, of course, uh, I'm a sucker for anything that's going to show off the museum a little bit. So it was, again, great to have uh, the team at the museum. Uh, and we're just grateful that you all would see it as a resource. And so seeing uh, some of the well-known uh, images that we have at the museum, and if the people from this uh, part of the world, there are some images, uh, I know who that is. That's Charles Goodnight. And so that was great. But uh, I loved a few a few certain particular parts was the cosmology of native peoples just talking about the bison and how important that is and and how the bison came about was that's always a fascinating piece 
And then getting glimpses of that third act. I loved that, just the poetic aspect of the return of the bison, but there's work still yet to be done. And then, uh, of course, the um, just the vistas, the views. I mean, it was, a, it was a gorgeous film, so I can't wait for the, the final product. And then you mentioned the, the your museum. So how will the exhibit at Panhandle Plains uh, you discuss for folks what for those that didn't make it to the earliest reception and discuss the exhibit and how it will kind of amplify the message of the documentary. Yeah, uh, we uh, as as a museum uh, wanted uh, something to coincide with this this moment, and so we uh, we came up with a bison exhibit uh, that premiered this evening. Grateful to have a lot of the folks there this tonight. Uh, what people will see uh, at that exhibit is. Um, what you sort of got in miniature here this evening is, uh, we call it uh, the, the fall and rise of an American icon. So it is a, an absolutely devastating tragedy, and yet there are glimmers of hopes through conservation in the third act. Um, but if you come to the museum, I hope you all do, you'll see about 15 centuries worth of human interaction uh, with the bison through uh, just incredible everything in that room in the gallery is from the collection of PPHM. And it's things that uh, maybe you've never seen before if you've been going to the museum for a long time, but really keying in on, of course, uh, native culture, native use, ceremonial use of the bison. And then uh, kind of that, that moment of turn where uh, large herd animals, grazing animals on the high plains, especially, but the Great Plains, um, met with the end of the Little Ice Age and huge horse cultures and so, there's this precipitous uh, downturn to the bison population, but of course, um, the Euro-American market for bison hides uh, is something that puts everything in overdrive. And so hide hunters and the railroads and bison tourism and then uh, governmental policy with removal and reservation for native peoples. Ecological consequences, uh, like we talked about here locally, the loss of buffalo wallows actually had an impact on amphibious and bird life. Uh, the black-footed ferret has disappeared. Prairie dogs have disappeared. Tall grass, um, uh, tall, gra tall prairie grasses uh, can't exist without bison. So devastating consequences. And then, uh, of course, uh, we got some great help from uh, Capar Canyon State Park, uh, Ted Turner Ranches, um, and others to really talk about conservation and what's, what's happening now. So uh, that's a little preview of what, what could be seen in, in the museum. That's great. Okay, for all three of you, if you would please weigh in on lessons from the past in this story that we might apply to the future. And I'll start with you, Julie. Well, um, I think the broadest one is this is a morality tale about how we interact with the natural world. And um, I think there's, there's a lot to be learned from that. I mean, when I made the Dust Bowl, um, when Ken and I made the Dust Bowl, I felt the same way you know, that these incredible lands were wiped out in a generation or two, these grasslands, and blew away. And so I think it's, 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 uh, it's something to consider. And, but I think the hope there is this motley collection of Americans, individuals, families who decided they wanted to keep this animal, um, we were able to change directions. If we, if we make up our mind we can change direction. We can go in a different way. And so I guess that's, that's what I take away from it. Okay. Juliana? Well, I would, I would probably um, just point out that, you know, indigenous peoples have had a relationship with this place, this continent for over 12,000 years. And we know a lot. And our knowledge has always been dismissed and it's uh hasn't been until more recently that people and scientists are finally kind of catching up and realizing that they're catching up to traditional ecological knowledge and so um you know the ideas that we have had and that we have used in the past for thousands and thousands of years are now currently being reintroduced so i think that says a lot about um what we ought to be looking towards. And maybe sometimes we need to look forward to the past and maybe maybe um, take some of those lessons that we were willing to teach 
for example, the um, uh, when uh, the colonists were here, they, they, a lot of the Indian tribes were burning grass, burning forests, controlled burns, and they were doing that intentionally. And it became outlawed and banned. You're no longer allowed to do this because you're destroying this habitat. Well, now we're reintroducing that today. Um, and in fact, the state of California now um, works with indigenous tribes in their state to to really kind of, um, um, you know, try to control the, the 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 wildfires they have there. So they do control burns with the tribes now, um, and not just on tribal land, but on state land, federal land. So. It's a it's it's a really exciting time um, in that in that sense. So I think maybe perhaps that's something we need to kind of really start putting our focus towards. Thank you, Andrew. So really hard to follow. Those were great. <laughs> they are uh, the answers. <laughs> I would probably say, um, uh, in similar fashion, uh, it doesn't take much to tip the scales. Uh, I think this is a, a story to heed about the species, um, and probably. Unfortunately, this is another example of humanity's very large capacity to abuse good things sometimes. And um, what is seemingly an infinite number of something uh, doesn't take much, in this case, a matter of decades, to really spoil something wonderful that should be, I think, like the film was really good at saying, you know, it's, it's something meant to be shared. There's no ownership there. It's, you know, it's it's a good thing, uh, but you have to take care of it. So I'd say that's that's probably a take. I'm going to start with you, Andrew, and go back down the line. Are we beginning to do a better job of analyzing history through different lenses, and how can we continue to do so? I know that's a challenge for filmmakers and uh, museums and all sorts of other places. Um, yeah, that that's a great question. I don't I don't know if I can weigh in on doing a better job, but I'd say we we must uh, if you're going to be a student of history and allow to see things through different perspectives. Uh, you need to treat certain topics through history like a conversation. I'm joining a conversation at 11 p.m. when it's been happening since 8 o'clock. And so I need to know well, what happened in the hours prior to me. And that's why knowing history and hearing from other people throughout history, in this case, native voices, et cetera, et cetera, is very important. I need to know what terms have been discussed and what's the current state of affairs on a certain topic. I'm pretty late in the game. And... When we look through other lenses or welcome uh, uh, conversation uh, and look through history especially, uh, you're, you're joining you know, your mind to another and two heads are much better than one, not because they're infallible, you know, but because uh, two heads aren't going to really go the wrong way all the time. And so learning from history, learning to see things through different lenses, uh, having the courage, I think that's, at least in the museum field, that is... Uh, the beauty of the museum field is we get to create these experiences in which conversations can happen uh, freely and in a very safe place. So, um, yeah, of course, inc important. That's uh, This film, I think, hit it on the head, just diverse lenses through which to view this particular aspect and subject. Julian? Yeah, I, you know, and just kind of adding on to that, the thing that I really love about this film is that we don't shy away from talking about the uncomfortable parts of these complicated characters. Um, none of them are, you know, quote unquote heroes. They, they have flaws. And uh, we were in an interview uh, today with with Ken, and he said something that really stuck with me. And he said, you know, we 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 shouldn't uh, censor history, which we're on a kind of trend to do that right now. And um, I think he's right. You know, we have to understand our complicated history. We have to understand that we are all flawed <laughs> and um, there is no good or bad. There's no, you know, there's, there's, we're complicated people. And I think the more we talk about it, the more we will evolve as a society, as a people, as our culture. So I think that films like this, that give that perspective and open up the lenses to other people's viewpoints and, you know, understanding other people's value systems and that kind of thing, I think, is really important for all of us. Uh, I think one very specific example is Dayton wrote the proposal for this film in the 1990s. Um, we we dug it out when he finally got around to, to deciding to actually make it, and and it's it's remarkably close to what we wound up um, making, and yet we feel it was better for the weight. The, the time, um, because 
we ceded a lot of the narrative and perspective to indigenous voices in the film. And we might not have done that 30 years ago. Um, and we think it's a stronger and better film for some of the reasons, you know, embedded in your question. Okay. So I'd say in this particular example, um, I think it's, it's a better film for being made now rather than when we first uh, came around to the idea. That's interesting. You've been a part of so many Kim Burns projects that have highlighted our region, actually. And so I want to know what it is about our region that's a magnet for you. <laughs> I mean, I, all a surprise to me. I mean, when, when I was sent down here to um, do the first research for the Dust Bowl, I mean, this was, this was very new territory for me. And, and yet, um, that is my favorite film of all the ones I've had the privilege to work on because the people I interviewed, the people who survived the Dust Bowl were the same age as my parents. And it was so personal. I mean, my parents grew up in New England, poor, depression kids, World War II veterans, and yet it, I mean, it all just felt so familiar because they were of that same generation of Americans. And so I, I've always had, I, I just developed great affection. And interestingly, my 17-year-old son accompanied me on one of my first research trips down here. And he was taking notes and helping me scan people's photos. And we were out in Boy City and other places. And it was 107 degrees. It was July. And... Um, and uh, I had chided him a little bit. He had kind of longish hair when we set out. And I said, you know, maybe you should cut your hair. It's a different part. And he's like, no, 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 I'm fine. And in the course of interviewing, we were looking for people who could tell us stories about their experiences um, growing up in the Dust Bowl, surviving the Dust Bowl. Inevitably, they would start turning to my son and directing their story to him. And I remembered something my father had said to me, which is, old people love young people. And that was, <laughs> and you know, it was all that mattered in that, in that moment. I mean, I remember one man just saying to my son, and he, he had just told a story about how he would steal a bottle of milk from somebody else's porch to feed his younger siblings. He said, I always left a bottle. I wouldn't take both. And, I mean, it was such a moving story. I mean, he had younger siblings who were starving. And, um, but then he would turn to my son and he said, don't you ever have any debt. Don't, you know, don't buy a car until you can pay for it. And, and as we were, we were driving back to Amarillo after seven days of meeting all these incredible people, many of whom wound up in the film, my son turned to me and said, this has just been so wonderful. He said, everybody's so friendly. It's not like we New Englanders. <laughs> and I think my, my affection grew kind of through his uh, seeing that through his eyes, in addition to my own um, feeling of these are my parents that I'm talking to. Oh, that's great. That's great. Andrew, you've called, uh, in, in talking with you before, you've called our area the last frontier of the United States. So I want you to expand, explain that. Yeah, that, maybe I was being hyperbolic a little bit, but, uh, and I'm a transplant here, so I, I probably have a certain perspective, but um, probably mean it in a few different ways. Maybe in its surprising factor, uh, maybe, you know, I see uh, the Panhandle of Texas as kind of being a place a little bit off the map and here be dragons, you know, and there's a little bit of the unknown. So maybe in that sense of, you know, discovery, um, but if, if I'm, I'm thinking historically, you know, this being the frontier, of course, you know, that comes with some, some baggage, maybe that, that word, but I've always seen it as less of uh, rugged individuals coming here or living here, uh, but more forerunners. So people have always had to adapt. I think we heard it in the, right, Quanah Parker had to adapt. Um, people for thousands of years in this area have had to adapt to live here. I, look, I think of um, Alabate's Flint Quarry, just north of us, and that represents a certain technology that had to be developed for people to live around here, right? They had to learn to use this tool in order to hunt and, and get game and, and continue to live. Uh, that still happens here today, 
Uh, it really does. People come here to make a living. Sometimes it takes a lot to live here and to continue to live here. And it's really a place that's maybe never settled in that sense. Um, I can also think of a lot of people we, we have on the north side of Amarillo, Texas, 40 different dialects that are spoken mm -hmm. uh, by refugee individuals. Uh, there are a lot of people coming here to live, whether it's on purpose or in peril, and they're learning how to live, right? They're kind of the modern pioneers. It's just fascinating to me that that continues in here. So, so maybe a little philosophizing there, but uh, uh, this is in a way kind of the last frontier area. You can you can go boom or bust in your industry. You can you have some freedom to to kind of spread your arms a little bit and see what happens. So okay, it takes a certain kind of individual to come settle here at a time in this rugged landscape that has you know, very few resources that, you know, people were used to. And then on top of that, they come where the Comanche are. Like, what, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of, you know, nerve to do that. It takes a lot of reason. Since you've got the mic up, uh, you speak a little bit about your experiences in the presence of bison. Give us a little insight as to the creature. Well, for me as a Comanche person, I'm also, I'm a descendant of Quanah Parker too. So um, I was raised near the uh, uh, Wichita Mountains and we would go there as children. We'd camp there all the time. I would hike there a lot. And um, I spent a lot of time there and um, uh, you would see them from afar. You might see them on a hiking trail and, you know, you knew what to do and you were very respectful and kept your distance and whatnot. But since we were filming... Um, and when I was filming homecoming and being very close to them in corrals as they were being transferred or coming off of the trailers and and um, filming up right up close to them um, was a really emotional for me. It was um, uh, every time I would I would just look, and they just stare right into your eyes as if they're looking into your soul. And I think anybody who's ever had an interaction with a buffalo will probably feel the same way. But it's um, really emotional for me. It's like I'm looking into the eyes of history and um, to my ancestors. And it's like, oh, it's, you know, without being hyperbolic, it's, it's, it's a little bit spiritual for me. So, um, but I know that it's not just an indigenous feeling of our blood memory. And it's, it's really, I think everybody can kind of relate to that. The way they look in your eyes is pretty magical. It is. I've had the had the joy of that moment too. So at Palo at, at Capar Canyon State Park. So, Julie, how has telling the story of bison affected you? Um, it's affected me in a pretty profound way. I mean, I and when we were at, we'd, out filming on the northern plains, the southern plains, I mean, I could sit there for hours, particularly watching bison calves and their mothers. I mean, I'm just mesmerized by it. I am retiring. Um, this is my last project. And part of what I'm trying to work out is how to work on, um, as a volunteer in a retirement career, on restoring lands for bison to roam wild and free. I mean, it, it means that much to me um, after working on this film for the past few years. It's amazing. We look forward to seeing what you do. Uh, thank you all so much for this conversation and for the powerful documentary and for the accompanying museum exhibit. Uh, we look forward to seeing it in October. And we, uh, I think we need a round of applause for our panelists here.